<clears throat> this is the cross section. There's the King site. There's Lake Diefenbaker. The three units of interest to us are the upper Saskatoon group, which is Pleistocene clay tail. It's underlain by Upper Cretaceous, Battleford Formation, Snakebite member, clay. It's a marine deposit. And that's underlain by the Ardkenneth member, which is a regional sand aquifer. That regional sand aquifer is used for domestic water supplies locally. So those are the three units of interest, the Saskatoon group, the Snakebite, and the Ardkenneth. On the next overhead, I'll show you the geology at the King site to the base of exploration, which was taken down to the Ard Kenneth member. On the previous overhead, I identified the Saskatoon group, the Snakebite member, and the Ard Kenneth. Let me start at the bottom and work up. The Ard Kenneth member is 22 meters thick. It's a medium grain sand, saturated. It's overlain by the Snakebite member, which is, again, marine clay. It's 76 meters thick. It's plastic and it's non-calcareous. That's the bottom aquifer. Well, that we'll call that the clay, excuse me, the aquitard. It's the clay aquitard. Overlying that, disconformably overlying that, let me just back off for a second. The snake bite member clay was deposited 71 to 72 million years ago. Overlying that is a Saskatoon group till, which is, for, which is formed by one glacial advance and retreat. That's the Battleford Formation deposited some Younger than 30,000 years is the best estimate at this point. So we have a, an age discrepancy between the snake bite clay and the overlying till. The till is clay rich as well. The upper three to four meters of the till is oxidized and fractured. That oxidization and fracturing occurred during the Holocene period after, glaci after deglaciation. At that time, the water table lowered from ground surface down to near at present day levels and Pyrite was oxidized in that upper zone, increasing the sulfate concentration, introducing acid into the system, which was buffered by carbonate minerals, which are abundant in the system. And there's a lot of smectite clay, so we ended up with exchange reactions between the CA in the solution and the sodium on the smectite. And we end up with a sodium magnesium sulfate rich water in that shallow zone. Okay. So dynamic flow in the upper three to four meters because of the fracturing. The, uh, the underlying Battleford till, which we're calling the till aquitard, is 76 meters thick. So we have a plastic clay till aquitard, the lime green zone, and that's underlain by the clay aquitard. Both are 76 meters thick, underlain by a permeable zone, the aquifer, and overlain by oxidized fractured till. Geotechnically, this material is, this, these units are are, are homogeneous. You can look at the, the geotechnical parameters of the till, they're homogeneous, clay, they're homogeneous, and they're different. The differences occur at the interface, at the disconformity between the two units based on preconsolidation pressures. During till deposition, only the upper two meters of the clay were disturbed during glaciation. Let's look at the, at the uniformity and differences between, between geochemical parameters in these aquitard materials. And you can see that they are uniform internally, but between aquitards, chemically, they're different. And this is just an example of some of the chemical analyses done on solid rock samples collected during the stratigraphic test holing. I could pick rare earth elements, and you'd end up with the same distribution. Very well-defined boundaries between the two units. So where do we stand as far as the geology goes? Well, the geology, the aquitard system we're looking at, appears very simple. We have Till aquitard, clay aquitard, both 76 meters thick, separated by a disconformity. The aquitards are uniform geochemically and geotechnically. And the point I have mentioned is there's a lack of permeable layers in these materials. Uh, typically, people have worked in tills. Historically, when I've worked in tills, there's always been a considerable amount of sand layers in the till, which end up, when one drills a hole to put a piezometer in, you end up with a hole full of water because the water comes in from the sand layers into the borehole. In all the, all the test holes and all the piezometers we installed in these aquitards, down to a depth of 91 meters below ground surface, our holes were drilled dry. No water entered these holes at all. There are no extensive sand layers or sand streaks in these systems. Okay. So that's the geology. For the rest of the talk, I'll talk about data, isotopic data, solids geochemistry data, 
aqueous geochemistry data, stable isotopes. They're all analyzed on core samples collected at these depths throughout the system from, a, from two domestic wells located in the underlying aquifer and 23 purpose-built piezometers that were installed in individual boreholes, as I described, free of water, devoid of water in the system. We we're also, we we're also fortunate, it wasn't part of the site selection criteria, but it should have been, it was an oversight on my part. Uh, we we're also fortunate to have three piezometers that were installed by a gentleman called Earl Christensen and back in 1986, installed at this site some 20 meters from our stratigraphic test hall. Now, this proved to be very, this is, this is a positive thing for us because our piezometers were installed in 1995. Those installed below 30 meters below ground surface still have not come to static. They still haven't come to equilibrium. There's still water entering these pipes, coming up to some sort of equilibrium level. So as far as de determining hydraulic gradients from our piezometers, we could only do the upper 30 meters. And we were fortunate enough to have this long-term record by the Christensen wells that provided that information for us. The topography of the site is, I would, at the best, you could say slightly undulating. What you see in the background is the rotary drill rig. This is fall of 1995, installing, doing the stratigraphic test hole and, and collecting cores. In the foreground, you see the rotor, the, excuse me, the auger drill rig for installing the piezometers. Uh, upon close inspection, you'll see that the auger hanging from that tower is solid stem auger. We're able to drill to 91 meters in these materials with a solid stem auger. Again, when you pull the auger out, there is no free water in the borehole, even though the water table is less than two meters below ground surface. The piezometers that were installed, uh, you can see them. They've got, st they've got steel casings on them, that rusty steel casing. Again, 23 of them installed at various depths throughout the, throughout the st uh, various depths in the study area. As I mentioned early on as part of the the, the format for the presentation, the installation of these piezometers, again, was critical to success of this study. We had to be able to collect water samples that were representative of formation water. What I'd like to do is quickly show you how we installed these piezometers. The schematic on the right is that. It's a schematic. Nothing is to scale on that figure. Now, how did we drill these, drill and install these piezometers? We first drilled with the solid stem auger rig pulled the solid stem out, again, no free water. We installed the piezometer to the bottom of the borehole with a screen on the bottom. Uh, all surfaces on the piezometer were surface sterilized to minimize microbial contamination. The next step we did was through the, through the, the top of the piezometer, we introduced argon gas into the annular space. And the purpose of introducing the argon gas was to minimize oxidation of reduced materials. And we continued to introduce the argon gas during the remainder of our construction. We then tremied in autoclaved silica glass beads above the screen intake zone, then tremied in bentonite pellets throughout the rest of, this, the, rest of the depth to within a few meters of ground surface, and then filled it up with bentonite chips from there on. Every one of our 23 piezometers were installed in this manner. Now, why is that important? You, you, know, you can initially appreciate the use of the argon to minimize oxidation reactions uh, with, with free air being in the system. But the other thing it did is when the water enters the system, one ends up with a gas pocket, that green zone. You end up with a gas pocket that separates the free surface of the water flowing into the piezometer from the bentonite seal material. And this was really critical as well. Uh, one needed to separate the bentonite seal material from the water because the bentonite has many contaminants in it. Uh, for example, sulfate in the bentonite is, uh, soluble sulfate is 5,900 milligrams per liter sulfate. Sodium is 3,800 milligrams per liter. If one was to do a carbon-14 on, on DIC on water in contact with that bentonite, one would get 100% modern carbon, plus the other contaminants that are present. So we had to minimize the contact between the bentonite and the water, and this was our way of doing it, by introducing that argon seal into the, into the middle. Now, how well has this, has, this, has this design worked? Well, we think the designs worked very well. Uh, this is an example of one set of data, 
and it's collected from the well at 38.6 meters below ground, below ground surface in the middle of the till aquitard. The green line, the sawtooth line, is the water level recovery. And the reason it's sawtooth is because we were collecting samples for chemistry analyses and isotopic analyses at those time periods. You remove the water, the water recovers again. What's obvious from these sets of data is the invariant nature of the analyses. The sodium does not change. The sulfate does not change. These parameters are very consistent. And all I've done is show you the major ion chemistry. We have trace metals that show the exact same profile. Our belief from these data, as well as, the, excuse me, the delta S34 and the carbon 13 also show the same invariant nature. Our belief is that these data suggest that our seals are, that uh, we are not getting bentonite contamination and we're not getting sulfate reduction in this system, something that other people have documented in aquitard systems, the presence of sulfate reduction. The reason we believe that is because the sulfate concentrations, the sodium concentrations, the chloride concentrations not shown on here do not rise as one would expect if, these, if the water was in contact with the seal material. If, on the other hand, we're having sulfate reduction occurring in these in the water in these piezometers as a result of in-well processes, one would expect the sulfate concentrations to decrease somewhat, and one would expect the delta S34 on that sulfate to shift to a more positive number. None of these have been, uh, have been observed. So our belief is that our instrumentation is working, and we're collecting water samples that are representative of the formation material. Now, before I leave the construction, let me just show one more, one more graphic. And this is, this is an in, a downhole camera view of the screen intake zone of that 38.6 meter depth piezometer, the one I showed you the data for previously. Uh, this is after four years of installation. There's 30 meters of water head on top of the camera at present. And I think it's important to see what, to, to notice what one does not see in this well. One does not see a lot of clay or silt particles in the well. We can take this camera down to the bottom well cap and we can still read the top of the well cap. The other thing you don't see is the presence of biofilms in the system. There are no biofilms present on the screen. The other thing you don't see is the presence of iron sulfide precipitates. So our belief, based on all the data I presented, some of the data I presented, is that, again, we have an inert system that we're sampling that's representative of the formation material.